My father's family fasts the slaughter to feast the arrival of his bride. Ilocos, Philippines. So before my parents got married, my father brought her to meet his family, and they had a goat, and of course they starved it um, for a day in order to butcher it. What did she permit him to see, my mother, the first time he brought her to the ocean? The goat, hungry, mewling in the distance while my mother shrugged her shirt sleeve down, her shoulder fragile in new day. Or was it her wrist? which implied the unfreckling of her forearm, the susurrus of flycatchers, softened bleats of starving. A hawk is circling closer. What do we see when we see? I can see my mother, but never my father. His shadow darkens her arm. Her breast sinks to a curve we three know and there's enough time for hair to come loose, the popping of a button. A rat reveals himself in the corner, the way a woman tenses in and out of light. And my mother is coming to that point of breathlessness, humidity speckling her birdwing clavicles. And the goat's hooves rustle above mud before harm. The kiss. Do you really think if you bend me, I will love you? You crack my chin up, your hands brown pigeon scheming reunion at my cheek and temple, your jaw cragged at the end of your thick neck of longing. I claw onto you as the only tree here your swing. I'm mad for gravity, though. I'm bound diagonally to you. Let me push from your trunk towards the edge and my freedom. Leave me to wither while moss weeps in the corners, our halo liquid as yoke, waving from our bodies heat, our divinity melting. My dress blossoms loudly. You are still wrestling me closer. If only I could release to you my mouth just this once and you would leave me. But the shadows of your robe are so haphazard. I know you will try to smother me again. The poppies scratch. My feet reach beyond spring. So, um, let's see, how do I put this? So as the war is going on, which we witnessed, um, we witnessed this terrible war from our side of the US border, from our safety of the US border. As that was going on, we realized the importance of this thing called border and the borders that people create. And in the, um, in the book, in my book, the book. In my book, uh, there's there's a character who's married to a drug addict um, while she's witnessing the wars that are because of drugs. Um, and so I'm going to let you guess what is true and not true. My husband is here. He's not a drug addict. I want to say this. He's also my second husband. Um, so I'm kidding. Okay. So um, my ex-husband. Um, had, this is based on a true story, on the, um, the children's father stabbed and beat 38, I'm gonna read the epigraph, year old Janice Casarena threatened to kill them if they told and fled, police said. For two weeks, the children visited friends, made meals, and kept to themselves while living in the home. So um, Janice Casarena's husband, Robert Casarena, was my ex-husband's best friend, and he used to send postcards from the asylum talking about how ungodly our marriage was because um, you know Catholics don't believe in divorce. Right? A little ironic there. A loaf of bread. Jessica counts books, turns our picture frames over, folding the dead's flat teeth to wood. She asks, are they coming now? Jesus tells me to. And though I don't really know her, I've worn her sadness in this house. Her speckled shoulders soften 
below stained glass, the nagging slant of a corner. I don't confess how here an EMT once hunted my body for cuts, my nakedness glowing from the mag light, or all the strangers I've called at night asking questions too. Jessica drags her own shore of voices. She says she needs to kill, snags her nails inside her hair, and there are postcards which come from my husband's friend in asylum, which never talk of the past, of his children in the house for two weeks, a loaf of bread on the counter, their mother butchered behind the bathroom door, only cursive, each shaky loop nodding toward the fringe of God. Our chants roam throats of rooms and roses. When she falls to sleep, I gather her silences crowding my couch. And when she leaves, I clean her menstrual stamp, my two hands washed in blood. There are so many things in this world for which people are dying, for which we are complicit. Um, we are complicit as a country for what happened to Mexico and what is happening to Mexico still. We are complicit for how so many people right now are dying. Um, and so I'm gonna read this poem called Bodies and Other Natural Disasters in a Time of Great Natural Disaster, right? Um, just a few things. Let's see, um, I'm gonna mention a film, Unfinished. Has anyone watched that on PBS? It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, um, a wonderful documentary, a film, Unfinished, about a terrible subject. And so, um, a film, Unfinished, is about this reel called Das Ghetto that they found um, that the Wehrmacht decided to kind of film about um, the Jewish ghetto, and, and they made up a lot of stories. It was just Nazi propaganda. And so you'll see some scenes from a film, Unfinished, in here where, for example, they're practicing brisk or they're doing, um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing a ritual bathing in ways that don't, in, in ways that are meant to show their subject in an awful, awful way, right? Propaganda, that's what it is. Um, it also mentions here, Pinatubo, Filipinos, you know what Pinatubo is. Um, I spent my whole life knowing about Pinatubo. And then also, um, it also mentions the tsunami that happened some number of years ago. Bodies and other natural disasters. Six Jewish women are entering a bath. Their breasts, the only parts of their bodies fat enough to rise, and the cameraman, head down, remembers. The old woman was chanting a prayer. Cut scene. Now the men have been forced to bathe, and for lack of breasts, we can see the hooked ribs, the canyon stomachs, each shank delicate as a cockerel's and their beards curling down like the hair spilling above their soft, compliant penises. Each scene has been well scripted. Bathing, funerals, circumcisions, each practice of life in the ghetto commissioned for documentation. And it would seem like a movie if only there weren't corpses being walked over that same group of people asked to cross the camera tiredly over the dead. The point is for the people to look heartless. Never mind who laid the bodies down or who is directing the living behind the camera's eye. They are faceless, free of noise as the women and men walking now or washing and weeping. The Wehrmacht ain't only in their wet eyes each time these unpracticed actors look accidentally right into the lens. It's night. My dog has screwed his body into my husband's foot. Here, the untouchable blue of sifted light rises like skin straining to a church's windows. I am watching each fragment of film silently. The captions black tags of contacts, though, 
the two-pound boy. The cameraman calls him an actor, held quietly. His skin marbled like a ham is context enough. The quick, neat blade, blood dark as chocolate after. I never learn if the boy lives, though I really should ask lives after what? Survive the circumcision, suffer working the graves. Your uncle, brother, the girl who had crackers in her waistband whom you could have loved if only her jaw wasn't symboling her teeth now, her face in the skull barely visible. Ashes still fall in the Philippines from Pinatubo, sinking to desks like dandruff. We watched the powder drifting above us, thought at last we were witnessing snow. We were kids, what did we know? We only held our palms open, crying for our mothers to look, look. In Miyagi, the tide arches like the eyebrow of an angry woman. Walls break, people run, and in the middle of this, I imagine a girl also bearing her expectant palms, her lifeline, love line, crevices seeking water. I have woken without the sun, only these fragments of film strobing to light the different edges of our room. Dog here, tail of a cat cresting like a wave before it drops with the rest of its body off the bed. I cannot see the entirety of my husband's shape, only the rising and falling of his rest. What passes above me, I cannot name, and though I recognize it partly as grief, partly as thirst, and in my soreness, I remember my mother stitched secret pockets to my pants. She had coins, notes, pressed the paper and cold circles to my skin. My mother practiced safety, taught me to fear each dark sedan pulling near the sidewalk. So when my brother dropped with fever in Stamford, I laid his head on my lap, refused every neighbor who tried to lift him up. Memories jolt us in the marrow of night like thirst. Take care, we say, be aware and wary. Tug the latex tightly down the tip. And in Shatra, I trace the impossible spires. For how could such builders have taken care? My mother walks the emptied rooms in the house of my puberty, dragging her fallen leg. Her husband and children have left it's just, your dad works so much, she says. Easter's, Christmases, Sundays and Saturdays. She whispers to me the few times I call, pressing her cell to her mouth, those lips which drip syllables to ease my bruises, and the odor of Vic's waiting the dark, my mother snuck from her husband's bed. We call now to mix stories of cooking and cats, our throats soft to talk at all. And when I travel out of country, she knows not to listen for my ring. The last time I saw her, I was taking her home to bury her brother. Our women wailed like the ocean, though we never saw the water beyond the plain. Bodies stack upon bodies, the tide withdraws its claim. She says, Magingat ka anak. The Wall Street Journal says the drug wars crossed over. Don't you know, Minama Halparin kita? And I keep my borderland from her. Say nothing of our yielding necks. She must see the mounding dead here like a movie. As I screen now these fragments, the fingers shucked their walls, the slow collection of teeth. She turns the gas knob off 12 times, then each light switch a mother's dozen. She has learned to take care so carefully, her eye twitches with each winding danger. And there should be danger for all we've done. Cut back to the women bathing, the old woman's lips to bees. Their breasts, still beautiful, are sickled as waning moons and the grays of their bodies shift as they sink deeper their skin. In the middle of night and rising water, 
All we have is prayer. So, um, I promise I'm a really happy person in real life. Like, oh, like I really am. I was like, oh. Anyway, okay. Um, so this book, thank you so much for coming out tonight. This book is called For Want of Water and Other Poems. And I want to read the title poem, which looks like this. I had fun with the tab button, and my publisher had a hard time with it. She was like, oh, how are we going to do that, Sasha? Um, but... Um, it's about immigration, and we know that in this country, our stories of immigration are not monolithic. But this is um, based on a true story, and his name is Julio Hernandez. He, um, he was trying to cross the border where I live, the El Paso Juarez border, and um, his mom died on the way, and he, he had to drag her body across the desert. Um, when he made it over the border, um, a lot of people made phone calls, but they didn't make phone calls to help him. They mo made phone calls to immigration. For want of water, an ant will drown himself, his body submerging into ease, his mandibles, head and tenne baptized. How lovely to lose your senses to the cup of your want. A boy drags his mother's body across the desert, her fluids rising to heaven in order to quench her skin. How divine her body must have looked, clutched at the ankles, her arms reaching out in exaltation, her head stippled in rings of sand and blood as he walked with her, slowly, her fallen and moving shape the fork of a divining rod, her body shaking with each of his steps and for water, shaking to find that deep and secret tributary. I have dreams of letting go of water, of waking my lover to a bed of my urine, as my brother did to me, his thin limbs shaking to discover the shame of his inside self. And what did we know that to have and inside what enough to free was luxury. The boy walks with his mother. He is only 13, the age I learned to stroke on the toilet the blood off my fingers, and he cannot cry because to cry would mean the waste of his own wetness. To cry would mean to stop, to think, to differentiate the liquids moving down his face. To cry would mean to cry. So he goes on and, this is a common story. The boy is not a boy now, but every boy we have ever known. People find him. They help him to lift his mother onto their hands, their necks. They lift her to their own dark and desperate dryness. And they make it, yes, when they make it over the border to a mall parking lot, they lay her down. They fall with her body as a clump of bodies behind a city dumpster and people make calls from behind windows, not to the immigrants with the dying core, but to the police who come with their handcuffs and call her dead. No, to call would be to give her life a name, roundness to where there are now only angles. To call would be to remember all the other times that he has called for her, and the boy plugs his ears, shakes his head, doesn't know that he cannot physically produce tears anymore. Such thirst can rid us of these symbols, only that now there are mouths around him calling other names as men run and other men give chase, because how much do you need to give up in order to stay? A boy, a mother, your land and inner land, nothing. Nothing can be given, and he will remember nothing as he sits in a cell waiting for his sister to come to release him from his cellular pain. He will only remember water that want for the clouds to let go their rain, and how seeing them dropping, he kept pulling forward, their bodies steady towards that dark, uneven line. Last poem.
we draw lines so firmly now. Um, so two days ago, was it two days ago that Richard Wilbur died? Two days? Richard Wilbur? Um, I, I love this poet, Richard Wilbur. He has this poem called, Love Calls Us to the Things of, the wor of This World. And um, he, there's this one scene where everything, everything is dark and undifferentiated. And it's my favorite time um, to look at the border. I have this office that looks over El Paso and Juarez. And um, you realize the border is construction, it's artificial. We've, 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 we've decided to build walls to, to, to push towards that artificiality, but the land, the Chihuahua Desert, actually goes from above El Paso to down south into Chihuahua. Like the land itself is the same. We've only decided to divide it into nations. And so one of my favorite times is to get up and write in the early morning when it's still pre-dawn and everything is dark and you can't differentiate one city from another and it's all the same city coming to light. Um, and so I really love like those moments before light or after light because our borders, our lines aren't drawn so firmly. Um, this is a love poem. See, I write love poems too, guys. Uh -huh. Anyway, um, this is a love poem to my husband and I dedicate this to you, baby. Gotcha. Uh, it's called Touched by Dusk, We Know Better Ourselves. You map my cheeks in gelatinous dark your torso floating, a forgotten moon, and a violin crosses the sheets while you kiss me your mouth of castanets. I believed once my uncles lived in trees for the encyclopedia I'd carried to my father, the Philippines, the Ilongot hunting from a branch, my father's chin in shadows. I try to tell you about distance, though my body unstitches, fruit of your shoulder lit by the patio lamp, grass of you sticky with dew, and all our unlit places folding one into another. By dead night, my face in the pillow, your knuckles in my hair, my father whipping my back, how to lift pain from desire, the word safety from safe me, and the wind chatters down gutters, rumoring rain. I graze your stubble, lose my edges mouthing your name. To love what we can no longer distinguish, we paddle the other's darkness, whisper the bed, cry the dying violet hour. You twist your hands of hard birches, and we peel into our shadows, the losing of our names. Thank you so much, thank you.